I want to I want to talk about something that is is actually very very basic, um, but I can't assume that we all have un understand these things. Um, but I know for me, I was I was introduced um, when I was a teenager to this reality about walking with God that shifted my life permanently and that was understanding this thing called the will of God something shifted inside of me that changed the way that I think changed the way that I make my decisions um, and it was the introduction of the understanding that that God is God and he actually has a will and that we are called to live for the will of God, to live according to the will of God. And I remember um, as I was coming up 18, 19, 20 years old, um, within uh, the youth groups that I was a part of, and that's, that's all we were talking about, was what is the will of God? What is the will of God? And I remember this, even this, a uh, little booklet came out on how to know the will of God. And everybody was, did you get this book yet? We got, you know, everything was about how to know the will of God. Because it was this basic understanding that if you are in the will of God, living according to his will, you are in a very good place. You're in, you're in alignment with him, and you're going to end up in the right place. So I was, I was so grateful that I had had a chance to sit under some of that teaching. And so I want to share some of that with you today as, and, and in preparation for taking communion together. I had a chance to, um, when Margie were, and I were on staff at a church in Colorado Springs many years ago, um, I had a family that came to me and uh, the parents were, were very distraught and they were telling me the story um, about their children how they're, they're they, I think they were all teenagers by this point. They had three or four kids, and the parents were very concerned because their kids um, had no interest in the things of God. In fact, their uh, one of their kids was was pursuing uh, the occult and trying to learn about witchcraft and and how to gain power through uh, through dark things. And so they came to me and they just said, what are we going to do? They said, no matter how much we talk to our kids, it doesn't seem to make any difference, and, and we're scared now. We don't know what's going on. And uh, so if you were me <laughs> sitting in my chair listening to this, there's a lot, of, a lot of directions that you can go on that. But I knew a couple things about this family. And um, so I did something that I very rarely do, but... Um, and I, I took a risk because I knew that they could get really mad at me and never come back. But I started asking some questions, and I just said, um, well, tell me how you think your kids see you. When they look at the way that you live and the choices that you make, um, what do they perceive to be your highest values? So I said, for instance, um, Obviously, you're believers. Obviously, you think that God in your life is important and you want your kids to, to know and live for God. I said, but what are your kids seeing in you? Um, I said, for instance, let's talk about how often you come to church. I said, so how often do you think you make it here? And I knew the answer was about once every two months. And um, I said, so what do you... And, the, you know, they didn't hide that. They just said, well, yeah, we don't get here very often. I said, so what do you think your kids see in that? What values are you communicating with that? And I said, okay, gotcha. <laughs> I said, so what do you watch on TV at home? You watch things that are uh, ungodly. You watch things that compromise uh, the truth. Do you watch things that portray un ungodly philosophies? And um, I mean, how, how are you entertaining yourself at home? And 
their hang, heads are starting to hang a little bit lower. And, uh, and I just started going through a series of all the choices that they were making with their lifestyle. And, and by the time we got through it, I said, so in general, would you say that God's will is very important to you? And they said, I guess not. So what are you training your children to value? You say that you believe in God, but his will is meaningless to you. Why do you really even want your kids to know God and walk with him? So I'm waiting for a punch to come at any time <laughs> or to get yelled at or whatever. And, and, uh, and, and I said, and, here, and, here, and, the, and this son that you have that is pursuing the occult, they said, what you're doing is you're telling him that there is a God and he's powerful but he's not significant enough or powerful enough in your life that you would even rearrange your life to live for him so as to please him. So you've awakened in him the reality of a spiritual realm and he's hungry for power. But he can't find it in your home because you don't live for God nor do you practice anything related to uh, the kingdom so your son is just smart enough to I mean he's just following your lead he's just going farther than you have he's going to go after what you told him is available and real he just but he can't find it in God with you so he's finding it with his friends in the occult but he's hungry for power so there wasn't anything more for me to say except uh, balls in your court. I know what you're going to do. Uh, the good news is they repented. And they went back home and told their kids, we have been total hypocrites in what we told you that we believe. And we're going to reorder our, our lives, our family around the will of God. And they were all there the next Sunday and the Sunday after that. And it's not that going to church is the issue. It's the, the, the whole issue is doing the will of God. Now I want to, uh, I want to share a number of scriptures with you. You know, one of the greatest influences for me was watching my parents living for the will of God. I watched my parents consistently make choices where they said, well, what does God want? What does God say? What does the Word say? What is God's prayer? What has He commanded us to do? And I watched them seeking to please God in everything that they were doing. Our whole family was ordered around. I'm not saying we did it perfectly, but I saw that time after time after time, I watched my parents leading us and saying, what does God say? What does God want? And through that, I picked up a value system of doing God's will is extremely important. So that by the time I got into my later teenage years and was old enough to start functioning in the in adult mindset and had realize my own power to make my choices and set a course for my life I was realizing that living for God is extremely important I remember when I was 13 I, I was awakened to the reality that you really could have a personal relationship with Jesus and so I entered into that and said Lord I really want to know you on a personal level I want to have friendship with you but when I was about 15 or 16, and I began to be exposed to the wisdom of God, the ways of God, the superiority of doing things God's way, uh, I, I, I had a, a strong wake-up call, and I said, God, you know what? This is, this is like all or nothing. Either you're God or you're not. Either you, you are the truth or you're not. Either following you is, is good or it's not. And if, it, if all those things are true, then 
I need to completely reset my life. In every part of my life, I need to be asking the question, what is the will of God? Now, I found out later on that God was also, God was also uh, wanted to know what my will was, too. But as I began to train myself and train my heart and my mind and, and even my emotions to be tied to the will of God and learning how to please Him and learn how to serve Him, I was then able to come into a place of becoming a friend of God where God then started coming to me and saying, now what do you want? But that was because my will had been trained by the will of God. So when you come to verses like this, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Well, that delighting yourself in the Lord means that your heart has moved to a place where his will his way of doing things is so delightsome to you. Is that a word, delightsome? And so, I mean, you, you, you actually, you're not just doing it because oh, I got to do this or else, you know, God's got a big stick and he's going to smack you or he's, he, he's planned a, a big cliff for you to go over and set you up so that he can punish you somehow. But that, but that actually getting God's results in life by doing things his way is so amazing and so wonderful and in it you experience the provision and the goodness of God on a much higher level that you realize that wow doing God's will is awesome it's fun it's uh, it's just intelligent how many of you like being intelligent <laughs> I mean, it was just like, I win every time I do it. I win. I always come out on top. And so that was one of the things that I realized when I was 15, 16 years old, when I'm, I'm hearing this stuff, it suddenly dawned on me, if I do God's will, I win. I win in life. Once I saw that, I said, I don't want to do anything else. I don't want to be stupid. That's what Paul said in Ephesians 5. He said, so don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. I read that verse and I went, I don't want to be foolish. How many of you like being a fool? <laughs> you, know, when, you know, at the end of the day, you can look back and say, boy, was I foolish. We hate it because you know what foolish gets. It gets you something that you don't want. God's trying to protect us from that. How can we protect ourselves from that? Well, the Apostle Paul says, understand what the will of the Lord is, and you will win. He's not saying it's going to be easy, but you are going to be so superior in the way that you're living your life and the results that you get, you're going to, be, you're going to come out on top. Guess what? Your family's going to work. Your marriage is going to work. Your finance, every, everything is going to work. God has a way of doing everything. He has a will. I got to the place where when I would hear the phrase, the will of God, I would, I would perk up because I wanted to know, what is the will of God? Because it was so valuable to me to know what is the will of God. Because if I could gain the understanding of what the will of the Lord is, I also knew I had the key to pleasing Him. I had the key to wisdom. I had the key to winning. So when you come across a, a verse in the Bible, like in 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, For this is the will of God. Something should jump inside of us and say, oh, oh, tell me, tell me, tell me. This is the will of God. It should be one of the number one things that we're pursuing after. Now, we're living in a time where people are pursuing after the power of God, which is good. We need that. We're pursuing after prophetic stuff. We're pursuing after 
all kinds of things that, that exemplify the kingdom or pursuing after his glory. You can have all of those things, but if you don't have the will of God, the understanding of the will of God, you actually don't go very far. You will crash and burn somewhere. So one of the concerns that I have is that even within our revival culture that we have going on right now, and I thank God so much for it, that we, my concern is that we have a lot of people who are pursuing the presence of God the power of God, looking for revival to come, but they don't delight in the Lord or in His ways or want to know the will of God so as to order their life according to that. And ultimately, they're going to crash and burn somewhere. They're going to make some decisions where the power of God actually corrupts them. Where multiple experiences with God, even being caught up in the heaven, sets you up for um, things you don't want to have happen in your life because you haven't been anchored into the will of God. So let me, let me just share a couple of verses with you. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I urge you, therefore, brethren, Paul says, I urge you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, it's because God has been so merciful, because of how he set us up with his mercy, I urge you, therefore, to present your very bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. Okay, he's describing a response that we have back towards the Lord in our relationship with him. If you are really going to move into the mercy of God over your life to heal you, deliver you, save you, protect you, every good thing that God brings to you in spite of you, things that we don't deserve, because that's what mercy is. Mercy is we get what we don't deserve. And God, God withhold it from us what we do deserve. But in light of the fact that God has desired to show us mercy, Paul is saying, here's your reasonable service of worship and response back to God. Present every part of you, even your very body, to him as a living sacrifice. That means everything about you is all about him. You're reordering everything. You're... You're cutting off things that were all about you in the past and satisfying your flesh and your desires and, and, and every kind of thing that, that you wanted for you in order to fill up the hole inside of you and, and find some kind of identity and significance. He you said, you're turning all of that around and you're presenting yourself to God as a living sacrifice, not a dead one. But you're alive in the earth and, it's, and you're living for him. Then he goes on to say, and do not be conformed to this world. What does that mean? Well, here's the truth about it. We're all conforming to something. When you're, when you're not connected in vital relationship to your creator God, you're being driven by other forces and fears that are generated within the world in the way that the devil is coming at you that push you to conform to what the world has to offer so that somehow you might be accepted and loved and have your needs met. Paul is saying that's a dead end street. So don't be conformed. Don't let your choices and your values and your priorities be shaped by the world system. In other words, don't live so as to please people in this world in order to be accepted by them. They have what they're offering. But rather, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That means enter into 
that provision that God has given you to become just like Jesus. You either are going to be human or you're going to be divine. You're either going to live according to your human potential or you're going to live according to who he's made you to be when he comes to be born again, born from above, a new creation. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let God have access to the way that you think and what you value and how you look at things, your entire perspective on life. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? So that you may actually have influence. How? That you may be able to prove with your life that God's will is good and acceptable and perfect. Who are you proving it to? To yourself. Well, that's the first person that gets impressed. Because when you allow yourself, you break that conformity with the world and you're saying, no, I want to be conformed to who Jesus is. I want to be conformed to God's highest standard. I, I want I want to be in alignment with heaven. I want to know God's will. I want to live it out. I want my life to be his will. That's the highest place. Oswald Chambers said, we should get to the place where you are the will of God. Isn't that amazing? That we could actually get to that place where you could say, no, I am the will of God. You, don't, you, get, you can grow up to the place where you're not spending a whole lot of time, oh, oh God, I want to know what your will is. I want to know your Know what your will is. No, you've already become the will of God because you've so conformed to Him. You so delight in Him that He's now giving you the desires of your heart. Paul said, if we will live this way, your life will become a shining example into the darkness of the world, which is so confused and has rejected God's ways and God's will, which, by the way, really bothers God. The world has rejected God's wisdom. They've rejected Him as, as legitimate authority in their lives. They've rejected Him as God. They've rejected Him as their Creator and as, as their Father. They've completely rejected God. And they just said, we don't need you. We don't want you. You have nothing that we want. In fact, we just choose to believe you don't exist. And God would like to have some people walking around on the planet who have become the will of God. And that your life just is like a flashlight in their eyes. Just saying... Look again. God's will, God's ways are good. He is because he is good. God's ways are acceptable. They're perfect. And if you don't have what I have, guess what? You are messed up. You are substandard. You are missing the boat. I mean, I, I think people should be concerned about hell. But even be before they get there, they should be concerned about that their life is not working. Because they're, they co have completely rejected the will of God. What's happening in our nation right now is a prime example. I'm wondering when somebody... Up there in higher places of authority in our nation is finally going to wake up and say, you know what, we cast, we kicked God out back in the 60s and we declared our own sexual revolution that, and that we ourselves are God and we can have it our way and that there is no absolute truth. And now look what we got. And this is the time when God is planning for you and I as his people to be walking more in the will of God and proving to the world that God is a smart guy. 
and, he, and he's got a good plan. If you do it his way, you might be one of those people whose houses don't collapse in the storm. Joshua said to the Israelites, as he was getting ready, he knew his time to, to die was coming, and he knew he was, the Israelites were going to have to go on without him, without his leadership. And his final words to them was, choose you this day whose will you're going to do. Who are you going to serve? But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And it, it's, it's a scary passage, actually, because the people that stood up and said, oh, we're, we're with God. We're going to serve God. We're absolutely following God. We're going to do exactly what we did with you. And Joshua said, actually, you won't. Because Joshua knew something about what was in their hearts, that they still did not love God the way that he loved him. They still had not conformed to the will of God. They were still afraid of the other gods around them. They were, they were still entrenched in, in other kinds of things. And so Joshua said, as soon as my influence is out of here, you guys are going to get pulled into serving these other gods and things are not going to go well because you still have not yet learned. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I believe we're heading into a time where um, there's going to be a remnant of people who are going to be standing strong and true and saying, the will of God, the will of God, nothing else, no compromise. But we're going to prove that God's will is good and acceptable and perfect. I want you to turn to 1 Peter 4.2. 1 Peter 4.2. Let me start with verse 1. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, that's one of those verses that just kind of smacks you in the face. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. You read that and said, really? I don't know anybody that ceased from sin. Is that even possible? Well, the next verse is part of the key to this. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. What is it that it will enable you and I to push through anything and actually become better, more holy, more pure, more like Jesus? Because ultimately, when we talk about being holy, we're talking about growing up and becoming just like Jesus. Mind, will, emotions, everything. Full relationship with the Father that Jesus had. What's the key? That somehow you in your heart flipped a switch where you changed your priority. You made a decision, a quality decision. I don't want to live the rest of my life here in the flesh for the lusts of my flesh, the lusts of men but I want to live for the will of God. Now, now that's, that is one of the top quality decisions that any believer will make that will cause them to be propelled forward into maturity, and strength, and wisdom, and understanding, and overcoming. Sadly, there are a lot of Christians that never come to this place. They, they are happy to receive the free gift of salvation. They're happy to know that they're on their way to heaven. They're happy to own ten Bibles and go to church and whatever. 
but they never came to the place where they decided that since Jesus has paid such a high cost and suffered in the flesh on, for my sake, on my behalf, so that I could have what I have, I am now no longer going to live the way I have been living for myself. I am now going to live for Him. I want to know the will of God. I am actually living the rest of my life for the will of God. Say with me, will of God. I want to live for the will of God. That is a quality decision that you make that will shift the rudder of your life. I want to live for the will of God for the rest of my days in the flesh. In Psalm 40, verses 7 and 8, David is, is quoting the heart of Jesus, which gets, it gets repeated again in the book of Hebrews, talking about Jesus. But here's, here's what he saw. He said, This I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is written in my heart. Wow. That's just one, that's another one of those verses that just, you know, if you're spiritually alive, it should kind of smack you in the face a little bit and to say, wow, is that true of me? Because it reflects an attitude. You know, whenever you see, you come across a passion and a desire that somebody else has and you realize, I don't have that. Why are they so excited about something? Because you realize it's not true about you. And it either influences you to want to be the same or it offends you. But here is the attitude of David. Here's the attitude of Jesus. And he, he actually says, it is written in the scroll of heaven about me. <laughs> What's written in the scroll of heaven about you? What's God got written down about you? What's in your heart? Here's what it was written about David and about Jesus. Behold, I come. I delight to do your will, O God. There's a lot of people that don't delight to do God's will. You know why? Because it means you don't get to do your own until your heart's changed. God's will becomes your will. His desire becomes your delight. His ways become your pleasure because you have so fallen in love with Him and you have so come to see how what He wants is so good for you and how you will prosper in His paths and His ways. And you realize, oh, Father, Your commands are incredible. I don't know if you've ever read Psalm 119. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. It sits almost right in the center of your Bible. And almost every verse is, Oh God, your word. Oh God, your ways. Oh God, your commands. Oh God, teach me, teach me, show me. May I walk in your ways. I mean, it's, just, it's over and over in every possible way you could say it. It's all about, God, I want to know your word, that I might walk in it and do it. At one point, he said, Lord, if I walk in your ways, I will become wise. I will be wiser than all of my teachers. I remember that when I was in high school. I said, aha, I can be wiser than my teachers by meditating in your word. Why would anybody bother to memorize scripture and meditate in it unless they really wanted to do the will of God? Behold, it is written of me in your scroll, I delight to do your will, God. Your laws, your commands, your ways, written 
in my heart. Whew. So that raises the question for me, what's written in my heart? Now, fortunately, the Holy Spirit, when you were born again, the Holy Spirit actually wrote God's law into your heart. Paul says it this way in Philippians 2. He says, for it is God who is presently at work in you right now, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's what came in the salvation package that you received. When you received this new nature from God, he put in you an actual desire to want to do God's will both to will and to do of his good pleasure. They actually give you an interest in knowing what God wants. Part of the new covenant, part of the, the purpose for which Jesus came and, and died in our place and set us up to be forgiven and redeemed was so that we would enter into this new covenant with God so that we're no longer in the place where I've got to I've got to study the book carefully to make sure that everything I do, you know, I follow every jot and tittle and boy if I miss anything I'm in trouble. Um we have to work really hard at trying to know God's will and make it happen. And be perfect. Instead what Jesus did is he made you perfect. He cleansed us from all unrighteousness. He made us, he gave us the very righteousness. We became the very righteousness of God in Christ. He put us in Christ and then he took God's law and actually wrote it in your heart so that if you would pay attention, if you would make the choice, if you let the Holy Spirit have his way with you, you would find rising up in your desire to do the will of God. And then you would actually find that you had the power to do it once you decided you wanted to. This is the key to ultimately having sin disappear out of your life. Why do we ever sin? Because we want to. Scripture tells us all sin is pleasurable for the moment. I mean, we, we choose sin because it seems like the best option, the most enjoyable possibility, the, the thing I, that I need to do in order to get by. But once you see God's will and you've made the choice to do that, the Spirit of God is upon you, that spirit of holiness that separates you unto God and, and makes you like Him, the Spirit of God actually puts in you the desire to do God's will. In fact, you can even know it without even reading the Scripture because the Spirit of God is influencing you and teaching you and showing you the will of God. But the key is, do you delight in it? Do you want to take advantage of what's already been written in your heart? Do you want to live out what God has already written in His scroll about you? Because what he wrote about Jesus is what he's written about you because you are in him. That's amazing. If I receive the divine nature of Christ inside of me, it's possible that I could get his results. I could actually live the way that he lives. But it still remains a choice for us. I still have to choose about what I'm going to be conformed to, what I keep presenting myself to. What do I value? What am I delighting in? The choice of what you delight in is, is your choice. It's my choice. And I've got days when I am not making good choices about God's will. And I have to re-up again and again and say, oh, yeah, that's right. I don't want to be foolish. I want to understand what the will of the Lord is. Psalm 143, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. Does that sound like a good idea? So what does this tell us? This tells us God has sent his spirit to lead us on level ground, but we need to be taught 
to do his will. This is a good prayer for us. Lord, teach me to do your will. Because I want your spirit to lead me on level ground. But I tell you what, the spirit of God can't lead you anywhere if you don't want to be taught. In Psalm 32, after David, you know, I taught on Psalm 32 a couple weeks ago, but after David says, you know, uh, let all who are godly pray to you in a time when you may be found, for surely in a flood of great waters they shall not reach him. Then he goes on to say, I will instruct you, God speaking, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Only do not be like the horse or the mule who have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check, otherwise they will not come near to you. God said, I would like to instruct you. I would like to lead you. I would like to keep you on level ground. I'd like to keep you up above the flood. But if you're like a horse or a mule who's just going to fight you and you know, and you got, you got to get some leather and iron on them, in order to be able to uh, get them to behave so that you can actually go somewhere. God says, I have no pleasure in that. Don't be like the host of you. But come and, and submit yourself, present yourself. I've, I've got one horse like that. And he just stands and he just waits for us to walk out to him. He might even come to us, you know. And then I got another one. John's voice. <laughs> it's like a, a rodeo. Uh, he knows if you want anything from him, he's on the other end of the pasture. He just, he, he just knows when you want something from him. He recognizes. You know, if he sees a rope in your hand, if he, he sees anything, I mean, he's, he's going to do everything he can to stay far away from you. I have no pleasure in this horse. I can't get my will done. Oh, my. Let me just share a couple more verses with you. Maybe. Colossians 4.12. This is an interesting verse. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians in that area of your Bible and your Testament. I hope you're probably in the right book. He says, um, Epaphras was one of his um, helpers. Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. The will of God is so important. We're talking about coming out standing in these days ahead, being perfectly confident as we walk through these days ahead that we cannot control or predict. What is it that's going to cause you to be able to stand the way you want to stand in the future? The will of God. In all the will of God. We need to have a passion for not just some of the will of God. And I've watched believers who have said, well, you know, I'll take this and I'll take that. They choose, they choose certain things about the will of God that suits them or makes them look good. Or somehow they think they're going to earn something from God if they do that. God is looking for people who have said, no, all the will of God. Every part of my life for all the will of God. Because that's the only way you're going to have confidence. When you're, when you're fudging with the will of God, and you're being selective in the day of trouble, in the day of evil that we looked at last week in Ephesians 6, in that day of evil, you are not going to have the full armor of God on. You are not going to have confidence to stand before the Lord or to face the enemy because you know that you have been still conformed to the world and not fully obedient to God. 
your spirit will tell you something's wrong. And Epaphras was praying for them because it was tough times that they were going through. And Epaphras was praying for them. Oh, God, they've got to stand in all the will, all of your will. Let them be fully immersed, pursuing all of your will so that they will, they will endure, they will last, they will hold up. The same is said in Hebrews 10, verse 36. I'll just read that to you. He says, For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. There are things that God would like to fulfill in our lives. There's things that he's promised to us, but they're hard to receive, and it's hard to keep going until you get what God has for you if you haven't walked in the will of God. Does that make sense? And there are a lot of believers who are saying, God, why, why aren't you coming through with these promises? I, I, I talk to a number of people week after week who are just frustrated with God. Why isn't he doing this? Why isn't he doing that? Why am I not seeing this? And, and, I, and I have to say to them, are you doing the will of God with all of your life? All the will of God, or are you compromising? That's why you don't have endurance. That's why you're not receiving the promises. And the promises that you want to receive, it may take some faith and patience, as Paul says. By faith and patience, we inherit the promises. But you, don't, you won't have the faith that you need and you won't have the patience that you need to endure if you're not walking in the will of God because you know deep in your spirit He's not your first priority. You want Him to bless you, but you're not blessing Him. You know, a, a, the classic example was at 9-11. Man, we knew every God Bless America sign came out that existed in the nation was out plastered on businesses and whatever you know and god bless america blah 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 and what we should have been doing is had signs out there saying america bless god because america forgot god within about two weeks god's going to bless america when america starts blessing god god's going to bless you and i when we start blessing him when he sees that we're delighting in Him, that we long to do His will. His disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And He said, okay, I'll give you a good one. Your kingdom come, your will be done. It's about alignment. There's a lot of people, you know, we, we want to use that prayer in order to see miracles happen on the earth. God would actually like for you to be the biggest demonstration of a miracle as His will is done in your life first and is being proven by, by the way that you, you're living for His will. Wow. Ephesians 6.6 6. Paul's talking to slaves. He's saying, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. Is it possible to do the will of God where you're just giving lip service, you're just, as, as the Bible actually talked about, feigning obedience? You know, you go through the motions, in order to make somebody happy and just, okay, God, I'm doing your will. You know, it's what you require of me. I'm not really happy about it, but here I go. I'll just, you know. Um, and Paul is saying to these slaves, he's saying, you know what? Your obedience to your masters is going to be very shallow and you're not going to gain any ground in your relationship with them because your obedience to God is not from the heart. So how can you obey your masters? 
something has to happen in, in the heart of the believer where we love the will of God from our heart. The depths of our heart is wrapped up in, oh God, I want to do your will. Because what happens is that your obedience to God and your, your love for his will remains shallow and you may be on that course of doing a lot of the right things, but all it takes is pressure from the world what somebody else wants and how they affect you and pretty soon you're bumped off and you find yourself compromising you find yourself yanked around and doing other kinds of things you're not you're no longer doing the will of god and the world looks at us and guess what they call us hypocrites because we're really good at the talk but we're not good at the walk. As John Wimber used to say, you know, we can bring the good news, but we're the bad news. We have to do the will of God from the heart. You could pray for that and say, Lord, I want you to change my heart. I want a heart transplant. <laughs> Lord, I want to do your will from my heart. I want my heart to be so completely wrapped around pleasing you, loving your will, that it's the first thing that I choose no matter what situation I'm in, no matter whom I'm around. I'm not a man pleaser. I'm a God pleaser. You think that would make a difference? The only way you stop being a man pleaser is making a choice that you're not going to be. It's realizing that it's either you're pleasing man or you're pleasing God. And once you recognize that you have a choice always, you step across the line and you just say, I know I'm going to be a God pleaser. I live to do the will of God. Even if people reject me, persecute me, don't like me, rob me, defame me, whatever it is that they're going to do, I live for the will of God. But I might lose my job over it. Well, is God going to take care of you if you lose your job? Well, I don't know. Well, then you won't do the will of God. How many of you know that doing the will of God can cost you? Let me, I'll just give you this little secret. Your flesh will not like it. First Thessalonians 4, because this is the will of God, your sanctification. That means, if you, you want to know absolutely the number one thing about God's will, it's you being set apart unto Him. Sanctification just means I realize I don't belong to myself anymore. I belong to Him. I am now setting myself aside for Him. My life is about Him now, not about me. Here's the good news. He's about me. So what I need and what I want and my dreams don't die. They just get perfected in Him. And He brings them about in a way that comes, produces results I could never get on my own. But I'm, His will is my sanctification completely set apart from Him. But here's the next thing that Paul says. That is, he said, now let me, let me get really specific about sanctification. This is the will of God, your sanctification. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality. Oh. God, does that mean I can't mess around with pornography anymore? Does that mean I can't sleep around with whoever I want to sleep around with? Does that mean I can't go visit prostitutes anymore? Does that mean I have to be faithful to my wife? Does that mean that I have to save myself for my future spouse? So, 
yes, there are limitations where God puts limitations around where our, the lusts of our flesh would take us. But if you love the will of God, you say, well, that's good news. God, thank you for revealing to me that sexual immorality will destroy me and take me out of your blessing. And so what, the reason I bring this up is that your flesh is going to fight you in the will of God. Your mind will also fight you. Because there are things that God will ask you to do that don't make any sense to you. They actually violate common sense in the moment, but it's you do the will of God. Well, Lord, when it makes sense to me, when it's reasonable to me, then I'll do it. And the Lord said, no, you do it now, and it'll make sense to you later because you'll have a revelation about how my will is good and acceptable and perfect after you've obeyed. But in America, we don't go for that. Show me first. Give me the evidence. Then I'll obey. Then that, that reveals you don't delight to do his will. You delight in doing your will. And your will, in your will, you agree with God to do his will when it conforms to your will. When it makes sense to you or makes you happy or is convenient or whatever. That's not doing the will of God from the heart. God is looking for people who are just saying, God, I have to do your will. I've got to do your will. We're going to take communion. Here's how I want to wrap this up here this morning. Most of you know in the story, the final night before Jesus was betrayed by Judas and arrested, and then crucified. While Judas was making arrangements to betray Jesus with the chief priests and elders, selling his relationship off with Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, conforming himself to the world, Jesus was on his knees in the garden. You know that one? He needed to be with the Father to get his heart set because he knew there's no way I'm going to fulfill what God has told me to do, go to the cross and suffer at the hands of these Roman soldiers as well as these Jewish leaders and, and have them mock me, betray me, spit on me, slap me, thrash my body. finally nail me to a cross and take the sin of the whole world and then experience my own father turning away from me because of the sin. There's no way I'm going to be able to walk through that unless my heart is absolutely rock solid set in doing the will of my father. And so he tells the disciples, we're going to the garden, we're going to pray. He said, I've got, to, I've got to go pray. And he, he asked them, now, just stay right here. I'm just going to go a little bit further over here to have some private time with my father. He said, I want you to watch and pray with me. And then he goes off a few yards. He drops to his knees. And in that moment, history was changed it wasn't what he did on the cross it's what he did in the garden before he went to the cross it's not what you and I are going to do 
someday for God, some great things for God, and we see this harvest come in, and God uses us up, or uses us and raises us up for amazing purposes, and we see great miracles, and and uh, and we see that the things that we've been asking God for and trusting Him for in the days ahead. That'll all be great and wonderful when it's happening. But it's what's where we are right now that counts more than anything else. It's what you and I are choosing right now that's going to determine what happens then. And if you know the story, Jesus is wrestling in prayer before the Father. And he actually says these words. He says, Abba, Father, is there any way that this cup can pass from me? Is there any way that I can bypass this entire experience that I'm about to go through? Because Jesus is he's fully man as well as fully God. And it's going to be the ultimate test. It's going to require the greatest endurance that he has ever had to put out. He's going to have to stand. He's going to have to He's going to have to go through every agonizing minute of once those soldiers show up to arrest him, it's all out of control. There's not a thing he can do. He's, he's, he has to completely entrust himself into the hands of his father. He knows he's going to stand before Pilate. He knows every single thing that's going to happen to him in advance. But in order for him to do that, he's got to settle it in prayer right now. And so he says, Father, he gets, he gets out of his mouth the temptations of the flesh. He gets, he gets out in front what his flesh would like. No one wants to have to suffer. No one wants, has, wants to be mocked and shamed and, and mistreated. He is going to experience the ultimate rejection even Peter is going to deny that he knows him three times. All will abandon him. Papa, I don't want to go through this. Is there any way that you can take this from me? Is there, is there another way around this? Is there another way to satisfy your requirement in order for sins to be paid for? in order for me to give you a family. I don't want to have to die. But the words that changed history, that changed the course of everything for you, for you and I, was when he said, but. See, he reached deep down inside of himself because he's fully God. He's, he's got the Holy Spirit in him. And the Spirit of God in him is saying, God's will. God's will. Do it God's way. He could have listened to his flesh. He could have listened to the demons that were probably taunting him and saying, don't do it. There's got to be another way, Jesus. But he pushes that aside. He reaches down into his spirit and he says, but not my will, but yours. The Gospel of Matthew tells us that he gets up from there and he goes and he visits his disciples who are all and he says to them, guys, come on, this is my worst hour. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus knows that quite well, right? He's going through it. His flesh is saying, let's just cave in right now. But the Spirit is still willing. The Spirit still wants to do the will of God. If we would just listen to the Holy Spirit, we would be ready. We'd be on top of our game. We, we could go with God if we would just listen to the Holy Spirit because the Spirit wants the will of God. So he goes back to that rock, and he doesn't even have his own companions willing to do the will of God. That's a good time to cave in when even you can't get your friends to go with you, right? 
But he goes back to that rock and he prays it all over again. It says he was even sweating great drops of blood. And he says again, Lord, I've got to nail this down. I've got to nail it down right now. I am not backing up. I am not changing my mind. When, I, when those soldiers come to get me, I am not shifting gears. Not my will, but yours be done. Father, I've set my will with yours. I've set my heart. I delight to do your will, O oh God. It has been written of me, and I'm going to do it. How many of you are glad you did that? When we come to this table today, and Jesus says, as you partake of these elements, I want you to remember me. I believe that he would like for us today to join him. We're getting to do this and celebrate what Jesus did for us. We get to celebrate that we're going to heaven. We get to celebrate that we've been born again, that we don't have to worry about sin anymore. We get to celebrate that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus for us. We get to celebrate all of these amazing things because Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. And he's asking of you and me right now, will you join me in that prayer? Will you join me in that resolution? Will you join me in that lifestyle? Will you dig down deep and listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit who's trying to lead you into the will of God? So I want us to come. Go ahead and receive the elements. and You can either stay up here or head back to your seat, but we're going to have a moment of, of uh, coming before the Lord with our hearts and join Jesus in that place. Go ahead and stand and come. This is open to everybody. It's very possible we're going to be going through pressures that will literally threaten to undo you in your walk with God and knock you off course in a way that you couldn't imagine. Peter, Peter had no idea what was coming when he denied Jesus three times. But Jesus had prayed for him in advance that when he fell that he would turn and be restored and choose the will of God. What is it that's going to make the difference for us in whatever is coming our way? When things start to get darker, when the temptations get greater, when the pressures increase. I mean, we don't know what persecution is. What's going to cause you to stand in the midst of persecution? What's going to enable you to not hate other people, but to choose to forgive when people do things to you that you can't even imagine? We've got a lot of stuff coming that we've never faced before. It is more imperative now than ever that we join Jesus in that garden. If we're going to be fully like him, we've got to have his heart. He saw himself being torn apart in his body when he said, not my will, but yours. He knew that he was going to, his body was going to be destroyed beyond any ability for it to be repaired. No turning back. He said, I'm willing to die. If that's what it takes to do the will of God. I want to ask you today from your heart will you do the will of God can you say with Jesus as he said in that garden it is written of me O oh Lord 
I delight to do your will. I must go through this. I will go through this. I will do your will. I'm living for your will, oh God. That your greatest plans on earth will come to pass. Can we thank the Lord for his choice? And can we make our choice? Lord, I'm, I'm no longer going to live in these days of my flesh for the loss of my flesh, but for the will of God. No matter where you take me. Thank you, Lord. You just received this, this bread now. Every one of us in this room is in a different place, going through different things, facing different choices. I would dare say that all of us, including me, have areas in our lives that are not conformed to the will of God. We have a choice to make as we move into the days ahead. Do you want to stay where you are with anything remaining in you that is not in agreement with God? Or do you want to let the Holy Spirit lead you into complete compliance and obedience to God's will? Are you willing to take up the challenge of not being conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that your life would you present your life to the Lord right now and say, Lord, my life is going to prove to the world that your will is good and acceptable and perfect. Jesus said for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Part of the joy set before him is he knew when I get done with all of this, all this obedience to God, when I get done, my papa is going to be able to show off to the world. God's will will have been demonstrated to be right. So I'm going to do it. Is it worth it to obey God? Is it worth it to follow him? Is it worth it? The choice is yours, whether it's worth it. But God, there's only one way for you to find out. And God would like to prove it through you as you choose his will today. So as we hold this cup, can we say together, Lord, I present my very body to you as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you. This is my reasonable service of worship. And Lord, I choose not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. Lord, I want to prove with my life and my obedience that your will is good and acceptable and perfect. So Lord, I say, I delight to do your will from my heart. Lord, make me your will. Let's drink together. Now there's a decision sealed in blood. Wow. Can you feel the magnitude of this thing? There's a shift in the room here right now. I just feel it. There's a shift in the room the magnitude of stepping fully forward into this. I tell you, if we become this kind of people, we cannot be stopped. It also makes you more hungry for this. Once you become a person that loves the will of God, you want to read 
the last will and testament right here. You want, you want to get it all. Oh, God, what have you said? What are your ways? Your ways are higher than my ways. I want to know them. I want to obey your word. Not because I have to, because I get to. <laughs> Let's stand together.